Welcome to the Great Detectives of Old Time Radio. From Boise, Idaho, this is your host, Adam Graham. If you have a comment, email it to me, box13 at greatdetectives.net. Follow us on Twitter at Radio Detectives and become one of our friends on Facebook, facebook.com slash radiodetectives. I do want to remind you about our other podcast, and I want to mention Public Domain Video Theater at videotheater.greatdetectives.net. That's the video companion to this podcast, and every month you have a public domain video. It could be a television show, or it could be a movie uh, that has entered the public domain, and currently we're, we're doing uh, episodes of Dragnet, and also uh, programs that tie into our uh, current listener's choice countdown. And I provide commentary after each episode. You can uh, check it out, videotheater.greatdetectives.net. And also remember, the amazing world of radio at amazing.greatdetectives.net, featuring our summer of Angela Lansbury and past uh, podcast, including our recent holiday series. Check out 277 episodes of World War II themed uh, programming at thewar.greatdetectives.net. And check out my comics podcast at classycomicsguy.com. All right, well, now it's time for the last host choice wild card. And today I'm going to play an episode of Barry Craig Confidential Investigator. This is a series we brought you during season two and season three of The Great Detectives of Old Time Radio. It starred William Gargan as Barry Craig, a New York based private investigator. It actually had a pretty long life over radio, running for four years, which is a solid run, particularly over the 1951-55 to era. Today's program originally aired on February 2nd, 1954, and the title is Zero Hour. William Gargan stars as Barry Craig, Confidential Investigator. The brotherhood of man is a universal truth, in one instance, anyhow. I never knew a corpse to show antagonism toward uh, a fellow stiff. The National Broadcasting Company presents William Gargan in another transcribed drama of mystery and adventure with America's number one detective, Barry Craig, confidential investigator. Larry Craig speaking. Winter and snow do one of two things to a cliff dweller. He either packs his swimming trunks in suntan oil and mushes overland to a Florida beach, or he climbs into his mink lined parka, throws his skis over his shoulder, and hops a ski train to Stowe, Vermont. I did the last mention. I sat on a train wedged in with a bunch of ski lovers and trained for the cold country. Not because of any yen to be an Eskimo, but for a much less noble reason. Said reason being the pursuit of a buck. Will I please come, the telegram had said. When a client goes so far as to wire you, one fact is beautifully clear. This guy can afford you. In Stowe, Vermont, at the lodge, I baked the rheumatism out of my separate parts and joints in front of a roaring log fire the hotel provided. When the ice thawed out of my good ear, I got wind of what my client, an intense-looking chap named Parker, was trying to get across to me. The tragedy happened two years ago. Two years ago this week. Your wife, Jean, fell 400 feet and suffered an injury to her spine. Yes, someone had tampered with her ski straps, and on an especially steep and icy slope, they broke. Jane was badly injured. She recovered, but is a hopeless paralytic. 100%? No, just the lower limbs, starting at the waist. She's confined to a wheelchair. Two years now? Yes. Jane has been abroad all this time, undoubtedly consulting medical specialists, seeing if anything can be done to restore her. But? To the best of my knowledge, it's hopeless. To the best of your knowledge? You're obviously not close to the situation. No, I'm not. Since the accident, we've been estranged, Jane and I. 
Nice time to cool off toward your wife. It was not my wish. Jean excluded me from her problem. She turned me away. Why? Well, the answer to that is why I'm engaging you. Jean has never acquitted me in her thinking. She suspects you? Yes. Me among others. Oh, there are others who might have tried to go in? Yes. Three others. Name them. My wife's brother, Tom Cooper, a man named Alan Loomis, and a lady magazine writer named Wilma West. Well, what did they have against your wife two years ago? Well, I, uh, I'd rather not influence you with prejudices of my own. It'd be better if you found out for yourself. I see. Oh, well, answer me this. Why are you ordering an investigation now, uh, two years after the mishap? Well, it happened up here in 1952, this anniversary weekend. And uh, strange as it may seem, Tom Cooper, Alan Loomis, Wilma West, and myself, the four suspects, we're all here right now. Grand reunion. Skiers come to ski country. Criminals come back to the scene of the crime. Where is the victim right now? Your estranged wife, Jean. Don't tell me she's also in the lodge. No, in the village, in a rented cottage. Well, why is she in her condition? I, I don't know. I, I've wondered about it, but I, I don't know. What do you hope to gain from my investigation, Parker? Vindication. Jean's goodwill. So I can live with myself. We investigate a two-year-old accident. Two years. I'd be plowing through a lot of cobwebs. Getting unpacked in my room, somebody went out of his way to make me feel unwelcome. Come in. A guy with one blue eye and a black patch where his other eye figured to be. A tough look to him, like the world was too populated for his liking. Am I intruding? You not. I said come in. You're Barry Craig. That's how I registered. A New York detective. That's not on the register. It's written all over you. Which suspect are you? Suspect? Now look here. Relax. He... Well, which is it? Tom Cooper or an Alan Loomis? I'm Tom Cooper. This is Gene Parker's brother. Gene's my sister, yes. And you're here to threaten me. To talk sense at you. That's polite for threaten. So go ahead. Worry me. All right. I did come to say I don't relish being hounded and harassed by a detective. I'm here for fun and skiing. Well, how do you know my uh, intentions toward you? I saw you closeted with my moron brother-in-law, Parker. Guessing Parker's scheme wasn't hard. Scheme? A grandstand play. Hire a detective to show how he's burning to unravel an old mystery. And by doing it, make himself look good. Is that a hint you think Parker's responsible for his wife's condition? Not only a hint, it's my opinion. Accusation? Accusation. Slander. You can be sued by Parker. Parker tries it, I'll brain him. Craig, go home. Sure, in good time. You'll just make a nuisance of yourself to everybody here. It's what I'm paid for. All right, milk the situation. Worry a case that had better be forgotten. But don't come near me. Or? Are you deliberately baiting me? A guy looks and barks like he's little Caesar. I'm always curious about the size of his bite. How do you want to leave, Cooper? How do I? Walking or crawling. Tom Cooper wasn't the only weekend skier who had me figured as a pesky killjoy. Another one tried to make me feel unwelcome. But this one wasn't as forward as Cooper. This one was the bashful type who believed in voicing his sentiments from afar. <laughs> A rifle bullet through my room window. Not intended to kill me. Just discourage me. The bullet lay at my feet. I pocketed it for a souvenir. <laughs> no doubt about it. It was going to be a weekend to remember. Roads get impassable because of a snow block. You give transportation back to the horses. I rented a sleigh drawn by a horse. My destination? The village. To introduce myself to Mrs. Jean Parker. Pay my respect. En route, still in sight of the lodge, a lady on snowshoes and bundled in furs like a meat polar bear hailed me like she wanted to thumb a ride. Yoo hoo! Hey! Yes? Going to the village? I am. Can you take me? Take lifts from strangers, lady. You're living dangerously. Uh, you have a respectable look. <sighs> Giddy app. Besides, you're not a stranger. No? No. 
We have a past together, only I can't place the face. Spoken like a male. You're Barry Craig, and I'm Wilma West. Oh, another one of my suspects. Yes, I'm a fiendish murderess. Would-be murderess. The victim survived, I hear tell. Victim. It's like a page out of ancient history, so remote. Yeah, two years makes any event stale, except to the victim. Confined to a wheelchair yesterday and today, merge for you. Put it that way, I'm chastened. Anything you can tell me? To clear myself of suspicion? Don't work so hard at being sophisticated. Oh, but I must. It's my style. It's my livelihood. I'm a sophisticated editor of a smart magazine. Jean Parker. What did you have against her two years ago? Let me see. Oh, yes, I was the other woman. The femme fatale. Serpent in Jean's garden. You and Parker? Me and Evan Parker, yes. Did Jean know? Doesn't the wife always? She finds lipstick smears on handkerchiefs. Cancel checks for gifts she never got. Uh, All kidding around, you and Parker. Or was there something for real between you? Very real, Mr. Craig. Evan Parker loved me, and I loved Evan Parker. But? Jean wouldn't divorce him. She took it all very badly, very shabbily. She scratched and clawed. Did everything to embarrass and cheapen Evan's love for me. How does it go between Evan Parker and you today? (laughs) Nothing, Mr. Craig. We're polite to each other. We're strangers. Jean sits in a wheelchair between us. I suppose you know Evan Parker hired me to get at the truth. Yes, I know. Evan feels guilty about what happened to Jean. I'll make a prophecy. Yes? You'll get nowhere at all with your investigation. You'll fail as other investigations have failed before. You'll just renew misery for a lot of people, but accomplish nothing. I'll spoil everybody's weekend. I keep hearing that. Well, here's the village. Where can I drop you? Right here. You're, um, going to pay a call on Jean Parker? You said magazine editor, but I think you're a mind reader. I tied my sleigh to a hitching post and started to slosh the hundred-odd yards to Mrs. Jean Parker's cottage. But before I could make the front door, I had another interview forced on me. A guy standing to his side a few feet away from Jean Parker's place. Standing like he'd planned it as an ambush for me. Hey, you, Craig. More people know my name up here. And pedigree. You're a meddler. Rough talk. You'd crucify people for a few pieces of silver. Now, look, stop stirring old ghosts. Stop reopening old wounds. Stop spoiling skiers' weekends. I've met Evan Parker, Tom Cooper, and Wilma West. By elimination, I guess you to be uh, Alan Loomis. I'm Alan Loomis. Once involved with Mrs. Jean Parker. How? None of your business. In that case, so long. Hey, wait. I was in love with Jean before she married Parker. She left me at the altar to run off with Parker. It's old ghosts. I said you'd stir them. Go home, Craig. When I wrap this up? Crimes committed. Somebody must be punished. You through discouraging me? No. I can be stubborn, too. And determined. Sure. You're the type hero who can stand in an ambush somewhere and pump rifle bullets into a hotel room. You're not denying you took a pot shot at me a few hours ago. Craig, go home. Amicably with a bonus check from me or in some other way. In a hearse? Even perhaps in a hearse. I was on my way to see Jean Parker when you waylaid me. Do I have to punch my way to her door? Finally, at long last, I got to sit with Mrs. Jean Parker. Once pretty, but now very thin, with deep hollows in her cheeks. And eyes that looked burned out by fever. She was in a chromium wheelchair, a plaid blanket covering her lower limbs. I wish you hadn't come here, Mr. Craig. Evan Parker engaging you, it can serve no good now. You want to forget it? Yes, I do. Parker's my client. I'll do what he engaged me to do. Clear him of responsibility for your mishap. Pin the blame on who really engineered it. You can help me. How? Information and stuff. (laughs) 
Anybody could have tampered with my skis so that I'd plunge to my death. Anybody meaning uh, your husband, because you wouldn't divorce him? Wilma West, a rival who hated you? Alan Loomis, the suitor you left waiting at the altar when you married Parker? And your brother, Tom Cooper? And my brother, Tom. What cooked between you and your brother? A paltry sum of money. Our father died. The will left everything to me. Less than $10,000. Tom was resentful. Money was always his queen and his god. Tom accused me of exercising undue influence over our father, of poisoning father against him. Why are you up here in Stowe? Sentiment, I suppose. Paradoxical, as that may seem. I'm half a woman, but my feelings are whole. All of my youth, I came here for the winter snows, the winter fun. I see. You shouldn't have called up me, Mr. Crimp. See a woman in the prime of youth, like Jean Parker was in the prime of her youth, but crippled. Only able to live in a narrow area through which she could propel her wheelchair. The picture stays with you. Four suspects. If one of them had actually schemed the accident, I kept wondering how the guilty party could live with himself. Or herself, if it was Wilma West. The last mentioned party joined me at lunch in the big hotel dining room. Uninvited, she just plopped down. Don't look so put upon, Mr. Craig. Frankly, I'm not in a social mood. I am. I'm starved. What's good? Read the menu. Ah, oh, prime roast beef. Food for a ravenous skier. Order it for me with A1 sauce, Mr. Craig. No, not Mr. Craig. Barry. Charlie, come here. Roast beef for the lady. You've got away with men, huh, Miss West? <laughs> I'm at home with men. I had seven brothers. I never had a sister. That makes me a woman hater. Oh, I wouldn't be discouraged. You'll accept me or um, I'll force myself on you. It won't help your case, baby, if you're the guilty party. I wonder will you be so blasé about my charms tonight. What's tonight? The weekend dance, and I'll be wearing a Parisian import. Meaning I'll go for the dress, if not the woman? I don't look to advantage in these ski clothes. I'm uh, overdressed, dramatically speaking. Well, I've finished eating. So long. Barry, don't make me eat alone. Barry! The guy never lived who could shake a determined dame. She cornered me again on the ski slope. I wasn't skiing, just looking. I couldn't afford to break a leg, not while I was working. Barry? Breathless over me? Yes and no. Climb up the slope, I'm winded. I've, uh... I've got something to show you. What? This note. Threat against my life. Wilma, enjoy the short weekend. Your last. Where did you receive this? From Tom Cooper. Tom Cooper? By hand. It had been slipped under his door, he said. By mistake, it seemed. Since it was addressed to me. That's a funny note. Where's Tom now? Taking the high jump. Show me the way. We got within view of Cooper, maybe 200 yards away. Cooper poised like an Olympic skier on the most dangerous jump in the area. That's Tom Cooper up there on the peak. Yeah. Let's get down to the base. He'll jump and we'll meet him below. All right. Only we weren't going to get to meet Cooper below. Cooper, in fact, wasn't ever going to make the jump. A rifle shot from an angle I couldn't figure, the way altitude reverberates sound. But an accurate shot, it dropped Cooper dead in his tracks. Tom! He's been shot. He didn't just fall. Go stay with Cooper. I want to scout the area for the riflemen. I found a lot of snowmen, but no human being. Hiding out of sight wasn't tough for an assassin at any compass point. There were ravines and rocks and wood. Besides that, stare out at snow like I was. Your focus goes awry. You get snow blind. I joined Wilma. Tom's dead. Yeah. Drill in the right temple. Somebody up here is a superb marksman. What do we do? Find a sled somewhere and get Cooper to the local undertaker. Then inform the coroner. 
Want to stay here while I go get a sled? No. I'm coming with you. Murder. Tom Cooper, Mrs. Jean Parker's brother. We brought the body into the village on a horse-drawn sleigh. Wilma went the whole morbid route with me. She was afraid not to. Afraid to be on her own, out of my sight. After a formal report on how Cooper came to get shot, the local sheriff did some theorizing. An accident. Some bad shot in those woods who has no right to own a gun. It wasn't an accident, Sheriff. Oh, come now, Craig. Don't pump this up to more than it is. Cooper was shot from a distance by a high-powered rifle with modern range sights. Shot by a top marksman. It took only one bullet. I call that very skillful murder. Now, why would anyone want to murder this Tom Cooper? Well, that's a long story. And even if I don't know the half of it yet, but it's murder, bet on it. It was murder, Sheriff. Look here. This note. It's a threat to murder me. A threat? Let me see. Wilma. That you, ma'am? Yes, I'm Wilma. Uh, enjoy the short weekend. Your last. Now, how is that a threat, like you say? Can't you read? He obviously can't. Oh, now you're getting steam heated, you two. I read the paper, and I say it might mean anything. I'm marking Tom Cooper down as an accidental shooting. We left the sheriff muttering to himself and started back to the hotel. It was growing dark, and the temperature had dropped enough to make us human icicles in the front seat of the rig. Wilma sat as close as she could get, warmth being at a premium like it was. Halfway between the town and the lodge, Wilma lost the little warmth I could give her. She went from cold to ice cold. Barry! You're shot. How, how, how did I... It's an ambush from anywhere in the south woods flanking the road. Where do you feel it? Here, here in my chest. It hurts, Barry. There's a hotel doctor. I've got to get you there. Barry? Yes, Wilma? I... I won't make it. I won't make it. She wouldn't make it. I knew, looking at her, watching life flicker, then go. The second murder in a matter of hours. I turned the sleigh around. I... I had another corpse to turn over to the village authorities. Later at the hotel, my client, Evan Parker, put on quite a show of nerves. Craig, I've tried to contact you everywhere. Everywhere is where I've been. When you hired me, you didn't mention mortician's duties. Two frightful murders. What does it mean? Somebody is haywire with a rifle. But why? What reason was there to kill Tom and Wilma? I can't answer that. I could try, I guess. Yes? To shut them up. Say Tom and Wilma knew who'd arranged your wife's mishap two years ago. You think Tom and Wilma knew? It's possible, but as I said, it's only a guess. Well, dignifying your guess, if Tom and Wilma knew and were themselves innocent, then your theory can point to only one person. Like? Alan Loomis. He's all that's left. Tom, Wilma, Loomis equals three. There were four suspects to the plot against your wife. Four? Oh, you're including me. Let's say I'm not excluding you. You think I'd hire you, bring you all the way from New York, if I was the guilty one? Guilty parties have hired me before, in other cases. I'm a screen they can hide behind. It's not like that in my case. I hope not, for your sake. Loomis. It has to be Loomis. Find him, arrest him, force him to confess. Loomis, he's your man. I went looking for Loomis. I called his room, then checked the desk. It began to look as if Parker was right about Loomis. Loomis had skipped in a hurry. Hello? Operator, get me to the sheriff's office. Hello, Sheriff. Barry Craig. A suspected murderer is trying to leave town. Alan Loomis, about 35. Tall, over six feet, brown hair. Grab him and don't let go till I get there. Loomis turned up somewhere else right after you telephoned me. You've got him? 
I have. Where is he? In the undertaking parlor with the other two. And one bullet in him. Clean, like the other two. Where did you find Lomas like that? Right in the village. Sitting on a sleigh without a stir to him. Not 50 feet away from Peck's hardware store. Four suspects and three of them dead. That left Parker, guilty by elimination. Only thing, if multiple murder was Parker's reason for weekending in Stowe, why had he hired me to play spectator to murder? Me snooping around. I could only mean trouble for him. I went back to see Parker, tell him the sad news about Loomis. He wasn't in his room. I called the main desk. Hello? This is Barry Craig. I'm up in Evan Parker's room. He's not in. Will you page him for me? What? Oh, Mount Mansfield. Thanks. Mount Mansfield. I went to get into my snowshoes. I spied Parker from a distance of a hundred yards, toiling upgrade where the slope began to rise. He had his skis perpendicular to his back, and something that looked like a rod or stick wrapped in burlap slung under his arm. I got within hailing distance. Parker! Hey, Parker! He looked like he wanted to run, but how could he ankle deep in the snow? Then as I got close, he looked like he wanted to melt in the snow and die. I didn't waste any time on protocol. What are you lugging, Parker? I, uh... I thought I'd practice the jump, so I strapped my skis together. I'm not talking about skis. Wrapped in burlap, what is it? A pole for balance. It's too short for that. It's only about as long as a rifle. Do I have to wrestle you for it? No. It's a rifle. High-powered with a modern range finder? Yes. And evidence in it of three shots fired, maybe? Evidence of three shots fired. Cooper, Wilma, and Loomis. Cooper, Wilma, and Loomis. You sound like you're confessing. I came up here to dispose of the rifle, hide it, but now... But now? I don't care to save myself. Three murders. Why? One of them paralyzed Jean. All of them could have for the grudge they bore her. I meted out punishment equally. You crazy or uh, pretending? I'm your prisoner. Get the burlap off that rifle and demonstrate for me. Demonstrate? How good a marksman you are. Pick something off for me at a minimum of 200 yards. One shot. Show me a bullseye with one shot. Show me, Parker. After Parker demonstrated what a marksman he was, I went to see Mrs. Jean Parker. An informal visit this time, around the back of the house. I didn't announce myself right away. I just stood in the yard and aimed the rifle at a rear window. My second shot was aimed at a window on the side of the cottage. With that, I hurried around to the front of the house and went in with a crash through the door. Fear does remarkable things to people. It gives them a strength and frenzy. It even helps paralytics to rediscover their legs. There was Jean Parker, out of her wheelchair, standing flat against the wall, to be where the bullets weren't. Mr. Craig! Yeah, Craig. Fancy seeing you out of your wheelchair. You were the one firing. I was the crazy assassin. I figured you'd hate being a sitting duck in a wheelchair, life being precious, even to a murderer. You're very clever. Yeah. I began being clever when your husband couldn't hit a tree at 200 yards, or even 50, yet was confessing to three murders. You planted a murder rifle in this room, this rifle I'm holding. Did I, Mr. Craig? Parker guessed your secret just before I did, that the paralysis was a fraud. A blind you could operate behind. A fraud altogether, or that a temporary condition had been remedied abroad. In the two years you were away. I underwent 27 operations. Parker was ready to shoulder the blame. To save you. He didn't yell frame up. He tried confessing to the murder. Noble of Evan. I'm touched. Three murders and your husband, the Patsy. You wanted them all dead. I wanted them all to get what they deserved. Yeah, Twenty-seven operations. The suffering you've been put to for two years. 
I guess the mind does crack under a weight like that. I guess you don't stop to think that only one of them was responsible for the accident. Nobody was ever able to detect the one. So you convicted all four of them and planned their execution. I'm not sorry, Mr. Craig. I'm not a bit sorry. I am. Right now, I'm sorry for you. You've been listening to William Gargan in another exciting transcribed mystery drama from the adventures of Barry Craig, confidential investigator. Tonight's story, Zero Hour, was written by John Robert. Next week, it's the strange story titled For Love of Murder, about which Barry Craig has this to say. Next week, the ways of a maid with a man is so torrid it electrifies the poor stiff. Sends him right out of this world. Do I mean literally? I wonder. Good night, folks. See you next week. <laughs> The National Broadcasting Company has brought you William Gargan, starring as Barry Craig, confidential investigator. Featured in the role of Wilma was Connie Ford. This is Don Pardo speaking. Jack Webb stars in Dragnet next on the NBC radio network. Welcome back. There's so much that I really liked about this episode. One thing was that uh, at least a couple of the suspects in this case were more fleshed out than we typically see uh, in other programs. Uh, the, you know, particularly Wilma, I thought they did a good job writing her, and she could have been the person who was responsible for the accident. Uh, or she could uh, not have been. You really could see it both ways with her. The mystery was quite good. There was a lot of suspense and a really good surprise at the end. I'm a little disappointed that we didn't actually find out who was behind the original accident, but I thought that Barry was was superb and just did show some good common sense thinking. Uh, you know, there is a really strong working class sense to William Gargan and particularly purely in the way he played uh, Barry Craig. So you get the sense that these are some uh, really smart uh, deductions, but they are, aren't like overly uh, brainy. They're really practical, instinctive, but still really logical and well thought out. One thing I also appreciated was the music uh, for this. Uh, not only the theme, but the incidentals. Uh, Barry Craig had not yet switched over to the same library uh, music for all of the uh, incidentals and such that was used on every other NBC program, such as Crime and Peter Chambers. So, some smart writing, good acting, and a pretty solid mystery. Uh, I really love uh, Barry Craig. I'm disappointed uh, that we haven't had more episodes emerge of this series. It seems like there should be plenty because it was uh, a tra uh, tr uh, transcribed series. And it was broadcast during a time where it seems like there should have been uh, plenty of uh, disc made and uh, pretty strong odds of survival. But alas, less than 60 of the 192 programs made are in circulation. But those programs are just really great. I love them. And uh, so many reasons uh, that I enjoy the series. Uh, and I will mention that uh, Barry Craig was actually, I believe, the last series that was eliminated in the listener's choice voting. So it was really close between this and other series that made it. So I was really happy to 
Now, we do have a couple comments on the recent number five on the Standard Division countdown from Lisa Richard Diamond. I love the reference to both Vaughn Moreau and Hearthstone of the Death Squad. I found so many actors to watch on old movies from your podcast or just found a new appreciation for them. I like watching uh, Turner Classic Movies or Alley also. Now I find my interest uh, renewed in actors like Dick Powell and Gerald Moore and have a much better appreciation of their work ethics and talents. Thank you, Adam. Well, thank you, Lisa. And I've uh, definitely grown uh, to appreciate uh, Dick Powell, other actors more. I uh, got a copy of The Reformer and The Redhead. I watched uh, that one uh, pretty recently, and I've got to thank some... A Million, uh, which is another Dick Powell film, on my uh, wish list. So I uh, definitely have found some uh, appreciation for different actors and different genres uh, through listening to radio. Chris comments, uh, one of the best episodes ever. Now, I do know that some listeners did have trouble downloading that episode, and I'm not certain what went wrong with it in the first place, uh, because... Uh, the episodes, there was complaints that the speeds sounded like chipmunks, uh, but the episode as initially uploaded was at normal speed, so I ha I don't know what may have happened, but I do believe the issue has been fixed. Uh, so uh, if you had trouble downloading it, I encourage you to try again. Sorry about that, though. Um, all right, well, I do want to go ahead and thank our Patreon supporter of the day, and I want to say thank you to Fred. Fred's been one of our Patreon supporters since February 2018, currently supporting us at the Detective Sergeant level of $7.14 or more per month. Thank you so much for your support, Fred. And uh, that will do it for today. Join us back here tomorrow for Let George Do It, and then next Monday we get to find out the top of the Listener's Choice Countdown as we listen to the first of two shows that ended up tied for a third place in our standard division. And then, uh, in the meantime, send your comments to Box13 at GreatDetectives.net. Follow us on Twitter at Radio Detectives. And become one of our friends on Facebook, facebook.com slash Radio Detectives. From Boise, Idaho, this is your host, Adam Graham, signing off.